Ladies and gentlemen, Karen Sharp here with Professor Randolph Hemmings. Today Professor Hemmings will talk about the history of the U.S. Census race question. Thank you, Karen. The United States Census Bureau takes black-white racial classification very seriously. They threaten to prosecute anyone who refuses to reveal their true race. Today, we shall focus on federal census enforcement of America's black-white dichotomy. We will examine three points. First, how does the Census Bureau decide what race you are? In other words, how have the rules of census racial classification changed over the centuries? Second, why do they demand such a thing? In other words, what has been the government's justification for demanding that each American publicly admit his or her race? Third, what is the penalty for refusing to go along? How does the Census Bureau decide your race? Although some form of color or race has been recorded since the first census, the terminology applied, the categories defined, and the criteria of racial classification have all changed over the centuries. From 1790 to 1890, the census recorded only color or skin tone. The word, race, was first used in the 1900 census. The difference between color and race was not mere semantics. Until about 1835, your complexion decided the issue, not your heredity nor your ideology. Easton Hemmings, for example, was recorded on the 1830 census as a white man whose colored mother, Sally, lived with him. Millions of Americans of the time, in both slave states and free, were accepted as white despite having slight black ancestry. Then the rules changed. From 1840 until about 1890, Blood fraction or association decided the issue. If most of your ancestors were white and you were accepted as white in society, then the census taker classified you as white. But if you had too many black great-grandparents, or you were not accepted into white society, then you were census black, no matter how European you actually looked. The rules changed again during the Jim Crow era of state-sponsored anti-black terrorism. The one-drop rule of invisible blackness emerged around 1890 and gradually became law. Previously, the three census racial categories were white, mulatto, and black. Census takers' instructions stressed the importance of distinguishing mulatto from black. In fact, the 1890 census told enumerators to classify people into one of five precise gradations, black, mulatto, quadroon, octoroon, and white. But starting in 1900, if you had any known African ancestry, no matter how slight, then you were classified as black. As a result, thousands of families who were previously considered white were suddenly declared to be black. Finally, since 1960, Americans have seen census race as a form of voluntary ethnic self-identity. This last shift, away from a genetic or hereditary view of race, to a group membership view, was the unintended result of a cost-cutting measure. To save money, the 1960 census was the first to be self-administered. It was cheaper for Americans to record their own data than to pay census takers to do it. Before 1960, the census taker would determine your race by looking at you. The enumerator's decision was final and there was no established mechanism to appeal it. But once Americans were given the power to classify themselves, they saw the race question as asking about ethno-political self-identity rather than biology. This change has created three obstacles to the Census Bureau's mission. First, millions of white-looking Americans of mostly European ancestry but born into the black community, nowadays choose to consider themselves black. Second, millions of mixed-looking Caribbean Hispanics, nowadays choose to consider themselves white. Third, tens of millions of Americans, nowadays refuse to take the question seriously. They check off, other, and write in something frivolous like, human, or, American. More about this later. Why does the US federal government demand such a thing on the census? <laughs> 
what has been the government's justification for demanding that each American publicly admit his or her race. The earliest mention of the need to classify free Americans by race was in the late 17th century, long before the census, or the nation, was founded. At that time, 1691 to 1723, the rulers said that racial classification was necessary to prevent intermarriage. Intermarriage had to be prevented to stop the birth of Americans of mixed Euro-Afro ancestry. The rulers feared that mixed ancestry Americans would enable alliance between European and African involuntary forced laborers, and overthrow English rule. In reality, Latin American colonies encouraged intermarriage and yet were not overthrown. In the 1830s, after the Nap Turner incident, the government saw free African Americans as revolutionaries. They used the census to identify possible disloyalty. In fact, no evidence ever emerged that free African Americans were disloyal. In the 1850s, the federal government said that intermarriage produced mentally defective offspring. Census scientists published findings that mixed ancestry children were usually born retarded or insane. They said that racially classifying Americans would help prevent intermarriage, and thus protect public health. In fact, even cursory examination of the data shows it to be falsified, since many communities reported more psychotic mixed-race individuals than their entire population. In the Jim Crow era the government wanted to preserve white racial purity. The Census Bureau said that racially classifying Americans helped to prevent contamination of the white race. In fact, liaisons between white males and black females were tolerated while the reverse was often punished with death by public torture. Finally, since 1970, U.S. society has tried to atone for slavery and the state-sponsored terrorism of the Jim Crow era, by enforcing laws, regulations, entitlements, policies, and practices that favor African Americans. For the past four decades, the census has claimed that compulsory racial classification is needed in order to fight racism. In fact, no anti-racist or civil rights federal regulation or law enforcement over the past 40 years has ever used census data. In short, the practice of forcibly classifying Americans by race has been and continues to be justified by rationalizations ranging from the need to keep blacks in their place, to the need to atone for past racism, to the need to fight future racism. The excuses are often contradictory and always counterfactual. This shows that involuntary racial classification is very important to the U.S. federal government, although no agency can rationally articulate just why it is so important. Hence, the practice is unlikely to end within the next few centuries. The legality of refusal. What is the penalty for refusing to go along with the demand for racial self-labeling? For better or worse, increasing numbers of Americans are refusing to cooperate with the census. The 1970 census was the first to allow respondents to choose, other, and fill in a blank line with a race other than one of the government-approved choices. As of 1980, 7 million Americans chose other, most filling in something frivolous or non-responsive, such as human or American. In 1990, the number of Americans not taking the race question seriously had grown to 10 million. By the 2000 census, other had become the third most popular race in the United States, chosen by about 15 million Americans. In 2010, the number of Americans in civil disobedience of the census race question exceeded 25 million. The Census Bureau sees this disrespect as a problem. Their mandate is to force Americans to choose one of the government-approved races. And so the Bureau resolved in 2004 to remove the other choice from the 2010 census form. This led to a conflict between the presidency, under which the Census Bureau operates, and the Congress, which provides their funding. The president approved the removal of the other category. Congress disapproved and demanded that it be retained. In the 2005 Appropriations Bill, Congress gave the Census Bureau a harsh choice, either restore the other 
choice to the 2010 form, or lose their funding. The Bureau restored the other choice but also changed the instructions. The 2010 census form reverts to the dogma of a half century ago. It defines race as something physical, no longer based on voluntary self-identity. Also, in order to encourage compliance, the Census Bureau now promulgates the claim that refusal to answer the race question is a crime. In June of 2009, U.S. Census Bureau spokeswoman Sherry Lowe told the Washington Times that anyone who refuses to answer any of the questions faces a $5,000 fine. This claim is doubtful. United States Code, Title 13, Census, Chapter 7, Offenses and Penalties, Subchapter 2, says that the maximum penalty for refusing to answer the census is a $100 civil fine. The penalty for deliberately lying is a $500 fine. Whatever the maximum fine, over the past century, only two court cases have been argued over refusal to answer the census. In U.S. v. Sharrow, 1962, the U.S. Second Circuit Court of Appeals ruled that the reason given for refusal, that the census did not record disfranchisement, did not suffice to prove the census unconstitutional. In Morales v. Daly, 2000, the U.S. Second District Court ruled that the reason given for refusal, unreasonable search and seizure prohibited by the Fourth Amendment, did not suffice to prove the census unconstitutional. In both cases, the person was fined $100. Note, by the way, that the written regulation authorizes a $100 fine only for refusal to answer, to the best of your knowledge. If the race question intends to capture voluntary self-identity then any answer you give is by definition the best of your knowledge. If it intends to capture something objectively definable, then its lack of definition automatically makes any answer you give the best of your knowledge. The regulation authorizes a $500 fine only for deliberately lying. It is inconceivable that anyone could be prosecuted for lying about what race they consider themselves to be. Incidentally and in conclusion, my wife and I are friends with an attorney, accredited to plead before the U.S. Supreme Court, who longs for the opportunity to argue against the census race question. Given that in 2010, 25 million Americans refused even to take the question seriously, and that they did so with impunity, the attorney's wish is unlikely to be granted. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. A question. You said that in the 1830s, the census identified African Americans in order to monitor their loyalty. Yes, that is correct. The Nat Turner incident scared whites into fearing that blacks would try to overthrow the nation. But I thought that the census was confidential, and that nothing you reported to the census could be turned over to other federal agencies. Oh my! The short answer, Karen, is that census confidentiality is a lie. It has always been a lie. It is an ongoing lie today. In 1930, the census counted Mexican Americans as non white, and gave the data to Jim Crow enforcers. The government of Mexico filed an international protest, and Congress ordered that Mexican Americans be declared white thenceforth. In World War II, the Census Bureau provided law enforcement with the names and addresses of American citizens of Japanese ancestry, so that they could be rounded up and sent to concentration camps. In 1956, the census wanted to ask every American's religion in order to uncover secret Jews, but Congress disapproved the plan. From 2002 to 2004, the Census Bureau routinely handed Arab American census records over to Homeland Security, so that these U.S. citizens could be monitored for disloyalty. On each occasion, the agencies said that lying to potential traitors was necessary to in order to gain their trust. There are many similar examples. Goodness. I would like to learn more about that. Let me suggest. Make up a list of questions if you wish, and we shall schedule a special session just to answer them. Thank you, Professor.
Well, that is our time for today, folks. This is Karen Sharp. And Randolph Hemmings. Goodbye until next time.